is really going to be a conversation about what we've achieved and what we're going to be doing in the course of the next five to ten years in this particularly important area. And to have this conversation, I'm delighted to have, moving to my far right, Deputy Mayor J. Philip Thompson. He's the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives. He has a distinguished career not only in New York City, having served in the Dinkins administration prior to his current service, uh, but also as a professor at MIT. Uh, next to Phil is Borough President Gail Brewer. Uh, there has been no one in the city, I think, as long engaged in public dimensions of technology development than Gail. Uh, and in addition to her role as borough president, she was, of course, a long-serving council member from the Upper West Side, uh, perhaps soon to be a long-serving council member from the Upper West Side, uh, but also the founding chair of the uh, Committee on Technology and Government for the council. And to my immediate right is Andrew Roche. Uh, Andrew has been an entrepreneur in several dimensions. He, too, has been at it for decades in trying to think about technology, and has spent a tremendous amount to build out the civic tech space in the city. He is currently leading Civic Hall uh, and a terrific new development that I'm sure we'll hear more about today at the base of Irving Place on 14th Street. Uh, but he was also very early on interested in diversifying access to technology through terrific and path-breaking organizations such as Mouse, uh, which continues to this day under I think now its fourth generation of leadership. All right. um, so terrific stuff. Folks, thanks so much for coming here today. Uh, let me ask first if we can talk a little bit about the dimension of what New York has achieved over these last 20 years. Uh, we began behind Silicon Valley, behind Boston, behind Austin, uh, and now we're, uh, we're, we, we've become really one of the dominant, and certainly in the East Coast, the dominant technology hub, hubs. And Phil, I wonder if I could ask you to say a little bit about where we are today and how we've gotten there. I think you should ask Gail. Gail, I wonder if I could ask you to say a little bit about where we are today and how we've gotten there. Thank you, Phil Thompson. Let's think I know you a long time. Um, my understanding is I never want to contradict the great Dean Birdsell, but I believe that New York City, in some surveys, is number one tech city in the United States. So that even puts us maybe ahead of the Bay Area. But um, we have 330,000 jobs. 161,000 are the ones that are so-called high tech. But we know that every single industry is high tech. Every single industry is tech. I don't care if you're a bank, your government, your nonprofit. That's a tech job, and so that's why I think this discussion is particularly relevant. There are 9,000 startups in New York City, um, and obviously uh, a lot of money. $25 billion was raised for them in 2018, and we know that 85%, and I think this is a topic that is particularly of interest to all of us, is the workforce topic. Yes, that's an incredibly, absolutely. particularly since we're sitting here at the great CUNY, and Bill Thompson has a lot of information about that, and I know Andrew does too, but 85% of companies want to increase hiring new talent. They want to have uh, people from New York City. 87% of the companies are confident, this is what's important, that they can find the talent locally here in New York City. And perhaps from my perspective, and I think the panel, that is most important. But 75% of those same companies feel that the talent is not exactly what they need. Right. And that's what we need to address. 68% um, of the companies I just discussed have more open tech positions this year than ever before. Again, that's what we need to address. I must admit when Amazon came, left, whatever, uh, in Queens, I was on the workforce committee. And we had two meetings and then no more meetings. But the issue, of course, was workforce then, and I think we continue. We did hear at that time these kind of statistics that we have great tech talent, but we don't match, and that's what I think we want to talk about today. Absolutely. I, I actually uh, don't think beating Boston is anything to beat your chest around, because we're more than 10 times, we're 15 times bigger than Boston, right. and we're not coming close to what our potential could be. And I don't think um, we have a super coherent strategy about even what makes tech hubs grow. Um, and therefore, I don't think we're being really systematic about building the kinds of ecosystems that will make this um, an even much bigger tech hub. And, just, and I think CUNY figures in this in a big way. So I'll just give you an example, because just something I saw spending 19 years at MIT. MIT has 1,000 faculty limit by its statute. There are 670 faculty-affiliated businesses around MIT. 
670. The majority of them are cooperatives. The average size is 12. <laughs> they take basic research from the university, then walk across the street, literally, into their businesses with some of their former colleagues, former students, whatever, where they have these little businesses. That's where the invention takes place. And then Intel, Cisco, Microsoft, Apple, all build big buildings because they want to be near that, those inventions. And then those 670 go out to lunch every day. They have beer on Thursday nights. It's an imagination idea hotbed, and that is what attracts the big industry. I think we need a coherent strategy with CUNY to say, we're going to take our faculty and students in tech. We're going to marry them with people who do business development. We're going to have affordable space where they can have places to have their startups. And then we're going to have coffee shops and everything else, lots of dense interaction. Then the big players will come because they want to be tap into that ecosystem. So that's, I think we, because New York is New York, it happens almost accidentally. But I actually think we could do a lot more to be more coherent, interlocked, and then have a strategy for CUNY. Because at the base of it is knowledge. Well, I, I want to pivot to Andrew on this notion of incubators uh, in just a second, but staying with this for a moment, uh, one of the things that constrains this at CUNY and at public colleges throughout New York State are very restrictive guidelines on incubating businesses that are university involved. Is that one of the things that needs to, ex to change? And should we be thinking about the other 85 campuses that are not CUNY campuses that are resident in the five boroughs of New York as well? Well, um, just to add a thought quickly to what was already said by Gail and Phil, um, New York was always a tech city before even Silicon Valley. IBM was headquartered here. Bell Labs was on the East Coast. Um, there was a great deal of innovation. But um, the, the PC era and the Internet era was sort of captured. And in the, in the media's mind, Silicon Valley became a shining city on the hill, where, as Phil described, there was this ecosystem created between the big companies and the universities in order for them to be able to tap into the talent and the IP, the intellectual property that was being created by some of these universities. But the reality of it is now is that we don't have a tech sector, we have a tech ecosystem. And as Gail pointed out, every major company is now a tech company. Citibank does not think of itself as a bank, it thinks of itself as a tech company. And they're competing for the same engineers as Google and Facebook and Amazon. Um, the advantage that New York has is its diversity. And uh, tech used to be considered something that was uh, positive. It's now being viewed pejoratively. I mean, there are people throwing rocks at Google buses in San Francisco. Um, when we announced the project in Union Square as a tech hub, the community reacted negatively because of the name. It took us 80 meetings, and I don't know how many times Gail and I, I basically- I went to 120. Right, mm -hmm. to, to convince people that this was a center for people from the Lower East Side and around New York City from underserved communities to be able to get jobs in the tech industry, and we eventually got unanimous votes. But their initial reaction was negative. And so where New York has an opportunity to take a lead beyond Silicon Valley is not the specifics of how many, necessarily how many jobs. I'm not, I'm not worried about the fact that every company mm. is going to be looking to hire. What I'm worried about is that the people who are designing the future are not from uh, communities of color. Because many of those technologies that, are being, that were invented were invented primarily by white, privileged, highly educated, uh, uh, and mostly men in these higher end universities. And they did not actually think of the collateral impact of these technologies as how they negatively affect society. And so we, in order to change the direction of technology in the future, New York has an opportunity and a leadership prerogative to make sure that people from underrepresented communities actually get those jobs. And that's what we're focused on. And we need to create not just one facility in Union Square that does this, but help build what Phil's talking about, an, uh, uh, a collaborative ecosystem where employers, universities, public officials, uh, nonprofits, foundations, and philanthropies are all working together to ensure that the future is designed by people that look like the people of New York City. Can, can we talk about exactly how you catalyze that kind of, it, that kind of ecosystem to extend that metaphor? Uh, 
what do we do on the city side? How do we make you know, harness the CUNY assets? How do we harness the private university assets? And how do we extend it into the boroughs? Can we do what you're doing on 14th Street uh, in Jamaica? Can we do what you're doing on 14th Street uh, in, in Borough Park? I mean, how do we begin building that out geographically as well as enjoying the kind of participation that we need? Well, I think you have to start even before CUNY. You have to actually start with the public schools. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, CS for all, computer science for all, but it needs a lot of support. Um, you also have uh, schools that are what called CTE, which are basically uh, schools that teach a trade. Right. And these schools, I want to just pick up sort of on what Phil said, have, don't have the ecosystem, if you want to call it that. In other words, you need to have, if you're going to do food and finance, if you're going to do aviation or whatever it may be, it's the same concept. Every single one needs a kind of technology. Now, today's papers indicate that there's money from the state. I know that the chancellor has talked about having more computers. I could go on and on. But just last year, we got permission from the state to have a computer science teacher, not a biology teacher, who's out of title and teaching. So in other words, you got to start there. Some of those young people, and uh, Andrew knows better, with the right degree can go right into a job. You don't have to be going to college at that moment. Um, but we don't have that kind of support, as they do in other countries, going right into uh, that. And the second thing I would say about what we need to do is, I mean, I got to give, uh, you know, uh, Cornell Tech uh, credit, you know, in terms of they're trying to do the ecosystem that was described. I do think there are a lot of big companies here, but in order to get, uh, you know, CUNY funding is necessary in order to have that kind of support. There was some discussion a while ago when you graduate CUNY, and I teach at Hunter, so I have some sense of this, you could also end up with some kind of a computer Microsoft uh, degree, something that gives you an extra leg up. So uh, it, it, this, you know, we need to figure out even just the technology support, as you know better, Baruch is a great campus. Not every campus looks as beautiful as Baruch and has the support just in terms of the software and the hardware. Um, sometimes the public schools don't have enough support in terms of bandwidth to be able to handle the teaching that could go on in terms of computer science. So there's a lot of infrastructure, I think, in order to get to what you're you're talking about. And we do have things like the P-TECH initiative at City Tech, yes, and IBM do. was heavily involved, so we yes. do get to some of There's that. a couple of them. Well, I, I think uh, two things. One, I think there needs to be a mindset change. And I'm a two-time CUNY grad, but no one ever, when they introduce me, they never say, Phil's a two-time CUNY grad. They say, Phil's MIT. Right. Right, because that is what's really, oh, shiny apple MIT not shiny apple CUNY. Even at CUNY, I'm not introduced as a CUNY grad. <laughs> when I was at MIT, there was a Nobel Prize winner named Jerome Friedman, Nobel Prize winner in particle physics. He's the guy who discovered quarks. Right. He's a CCNY grad. He said to me, in my entire career, CUNY has never asked me to come back for anything. They've never given me recognition. They've never said we're proud of our CUNY grads. They've never asked me to go raise money. He's the tech guru. Everyone worships this guy. He's, CUNY doesn't. Right. So I think there has to be a mindset change in terms of who's in CUNY and the potential of the people in CUNY, Andrew's point. I have a young cousin, I've said, not young. He's seven years younger than me, he's not young. <laughs> but he was a basketball player. He was never focused on academics at all, got turned on to, and he was a great basketball player, got turned on to computer science late in his college career, stopped playing basketball, which freaked everybody out, like, what are you gonna do? But when he got out of school, he said, you know, when I watch basketball on TV, they don't see what I see as a player, the cuts, the angles, I'm always doing calculations. They, you can't see it. So he invented a way of flying a camera on wires and controlling it from a joystick, which became a company called Skycam. You can't watch a football game or a basketball game where you don't see his product you know, being flown around, because that's what they use for NBA. No kid at, MI at MIT ever could have invented that. Because MIT, I've never even seen a kid at MIT dunk. They don't play <laughs> basketball. They don't even know the angles, right? Our kids have stuff that they can bring to the table when we're thinking about the future of tech. No one else can. 
right. because of their lived, but we don't value that. So that's the first point, mm -hmm. like valuing who's in CUNY. One in five compu black computer science majors in America are in CUNY right now. One in five. You know who told us that? Not CUNY, Google <laughs> did that analysis and told us that. Second point, I think the biggest impact of tech is actually going to be to make production, manufacturing, and craftsmanship local again. We'll be making cars here, local. Battery cars, the rest is assembly. Shoes here. The super tankers bringing stuff over. That's going to be disrupted entirely. And I think really partnering now, the auto companies are already thinking about this. How do they change their whole supply chain? What's it look like? Building the infrastructure for that now, I think, is the other thing we have to really pay attention to. If I could follow up on one of those points, uh, you know, you talked earlier about just by dint of population that we should be succeeding in much greater dimension than smaller places like Boston and, and Silicon Valley for that matter. Uh, when you talk about the, uh, the truncation of the supply chain and the localization of manufacturing efforts, is that going to be unique to places with large populations such as New York? Or is that something we'll see everywhere and we simply disrupt the supply chain logic uh, of business overall? I think it'll be everywhere, but I, I eventually. But I think the places, there will be leaders and there will be followers. And I think the thing is to position New York as a leader. The mayor two weeks ago said, we're going to move 100% of all our new vehicle purchases will be electric. Cars, ferries, buses, everything. Three years ago, I was working with the Ford Motor Company and the UAW that were saying, OK, if we do electric cars, how's, what's that going to look like? And they said, you know what? Economically, it doesn't make sense for us to make cars halfway around the world, rent super tankers, rent parking lots, essentially, and have cars sit in there for a year. We're going to do just-in-time car manufacturing. And it'll be because it'll be a battery, and the rest will just be assembled parts. You can do the design on the spot with the customer, mm -hmm. and then they can come back four days later, pick up their yeah. vehicle, custom design. Then UAW said, then the auto worker is not an assembly line worker anymore, just like putting stuff in. They're actually a designer, mm -hmm. and so they don't. We're going to have to be a different kind of union. Maybe we should be a cooperative union, and the workers should be part owners, and decision making would be different. That process, they were all engaged in three years ago. And so they're thinking that way. I think we should be partnering with these kinds of industries that are recreate, reimagining their new future, the new future of production, and then weaving, saying, OK, New York is the go-to place. We're going to build the infrastructure for you to start rolling out your electric vehicles here. Because we're going to have the charging stations. We're going to have the school, the programs at CUNY. We're going to have and DOE. We're going to have a pipeline for you and all kinds of focus on the new generation of vehicle manufacture. Terrific. Um, I, I want to go to Andrew and then to Gail on two linked topics. Andrew, I want to take you all the way back to Mouse, uh, but then to connect that to what's going on at Union Square as well. How do you create this culture of celebrating inclusive excellence? Uh, Mouse has a celebratory culture. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, and I believe you kicked that off, uh, a tremendous amount of advertisement of the, the, the brilliance of the children involved. Uh, and they, they do get involved with Mouse while they're still children. Uh, and, and what they're able to achieve. Can you connect that ethos to what you're going to be doing uh, a little bit south? Uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, so Mouse got started in, in 1997 when, um, frankly, most public schools didn't have any computers inside at all, no internet access. Al Gore had a program called Net Day, and a school was considered wired to the internet if one teacher had an AOL account. That was 1997. So Mouse started wiring schools to the internet, um, and then we quickly discovered a problem, which is that all the donated computers that were coming from banks and other offices, and even the internet access, wasn't enough because there wasn't any people working at the DOE that actually knew how to fix computers. So out of desperation and sort of by accident, Mouse developed a program where we actually asked the kids to fix the computers and do it themselves. And to our surprise, that's what took off. Um, and now Mouse is in 10 states, 20 countries, about 50,000 kids have gone through the program. 95% of the kids that go through the Mouse program have graduated and gone to college. Um, but to be honest, uh, I kind of feel that the program is a failure. Not because those kids didn't succeed, 
but there should be a mouse program in every single public school in New York. You right. think with those kinds of statistics, the policy people, the, the, the administrations that have, uh, mostly the Bloomberg administration during the last 12, uh, before de Blasio, uh, should have recognized that programs like this succeed and have different outcomes. And instead, only 100 schools in New York City right now have a mouse program. Now that sounds pejorative, I know, but I didn't start a nonprofit because I wanted it to live forever. I wanted it to become obsolete. The, the good news is, is that there are now something like 100 different organizations that are working on this problem of bridging the digital divide. That digital divide isn't just internet access, it's actually skills-based training because the divide isn't just about getting online, it's figuring out what to do once you're online and then maybe developing some of the kinds of ideas that uh, Phil was talking about, the kind of new innovations. By the way, quick, quick uh, anecdote, Henry Ford once said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, and, and so we don't actually know where the innovations may come from. We may not have actual cars being built as right. many to the degree that we want because we'll be using autonomous vehicles right. where people won't actually own a car anymore. Right. Um, we, don't, we can't imagine it, but you know, 10 years ago we didn't imagine that we'd all be using devices like this. And maybe 10 years from now we won't be using devices like this because they've been des they'll be designed better where they won't take up all of our time. Going back to my point about the fact that we've created an attention economy mostly around the sale of advertising in order to, um, to make money and have changed the way people interact with each other, which is a whole other negative thing. But back to the main point. Many, many organizations now exist that are working to try to bridge the digital divide and provide skills to underserved populations. Some of them are working in the public schools, and some of them are working now on remedial education. And some of them are working on upskilling because many people now have to change what they've learned in three or four years because the technology is changing faster and faster and faster. Coding, if you're teaching coding in a, public, in, a, in a program now, it's an obsolete thing to teach because coding is going to be commoditized in the next three or four years. You need to teach data science, AI, cybersecurity. Exactly. And so unless, so all of these organizations are leaning in to try to bridge the digital divide, but many of them are underfunded uncoordinated, not sharing data, and not connected to the employers that might hire the people that they're training. And so we have a vision problem, uh, a funding problem, and we have a uh, accelerating environment where the technology is changing every three to four years. So, the, the, so just to finish the thought, Phil, the, the idea of this facility in Union Square is to act as a beacon, as a model that can be, we're not gonna build new civic halls in Queens, in Brooklyn ourselves. We want to do this one as best as we can, let people come and see what we've done, open source it, and let people copy us. And come from the community. Correct. Well, I, I love the Civic Hall project. Um, I just want to say two things, that I think the key in terms of how we train young people is actually critical thinking skills. Not narrowly defined as traditional STEM only. Of course we need to do that, but things are going to change so much, it's not exactly what technique we teach today. It's like, it's how we teach young people how to think. So they can, you know. The reason I say that, hotels, and I've tested this with some hotels, they're gonna have kiosks in the front to check you into the hotel. A lot of those jobs are gonna disappear. They already do. Right, already and do. a lot of those jobs are gonna disappear. But it doesn't necessarily mean that hotels will have less need for human beings. Hotels will compete in new ways. So young, young couples with infants and with toddlers don't populate hotels a lot. Spending a few days in a small room with a two-year-old is not necessarily bliss, right? <laughs> so hotels will be looking, competing on, we have an amazing childcare program. Bring your two-year-old, and it will be the best experience, and you can have the day free, because their kids are going to be doing all this amazing stuff at our hotel, right? And then they're going to try and attract these young parents who now don't go to hotels. They'll compete, so they'll need people who know how to invent these amazing childcare programs, right? It's, and that's part of what the new economy is, too. Human services is going to become much more important and valuable. It's not just only tech jobs in traditional STEM. Second point I want to make, my cousin who I mentioned created Sky Camp couldn't get financing, period. Because when they saw this black guy walk in the door 
They were like, nope. And he couldn't get off the ground. Couldn't get financing to buy the company that makes the cameras, nothing. It, it just happened serendipitously in his church. There was a guy who actually created the Graco company that makes play, playground sets for kids and all that. That guy had sold that company, and he's the one, because they were in church for years, that actually gave him some financing, helped finance him so he could get going. If you're black, and what he did, he hired a white staff to do marketing, and I would go to NFL football games with him, and executives would come up and say, his name's Roland. Hey, you, boy, go get me Roland Thompson right now. I'm, I'm CBS this and that. Get me Roland. He'd be talking to Roland. Right. Right? It was like that all the time. So Roland hired an all-white staff to do marketing, because when they saw him, right, even though he was the guy. I have a 25-year-old, not interested in government at all. He has a startup. He has an app that visualizes MRIs. So doctors can see in 3D what till now they can only see in 2D. Same thing. He has a guy who works under him who's white, They'll, he'll go to do a presentation and, pe and the people will say, no, uh, they'll look, all look to the white guy and like, why are you talking to my son? Like, why are you even there? We have a deep problem in racism, in the whole mindset, in the financing world. And so part of what we have to do is, and, and it's with women, same, very similar. So what we have to do in part in government also, if we want the Civic Hall people to flourish, we have to actually help have programs, financing, et cetera, to help them launch. Because if we're relying on Wall Street and these traditional firms to do that, it's a chokehold. Right. So a, a, a truly inclusive investment and financing environment has to accompany everything it's that we do on the, the tech strat side. It has to be. Uh, I want to go to so the thank politics. You for, thank you for announcing the startup fund for the new Civic Hall. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I want to be there. I, that's right. Well, I, I, I want to go to talk about the politics of this in a moment, but I want to get Gail in here first. Uh, Andrew just uh, observed quite correctly that it's not just about getting on, uh, you know, getting access to resources. It's about what you do with them. But it's also still about getting access to resources, right? And you've been involved for decades now uh, with broadband extension and the access at, at you know, the household level, at the neighborhood level, uh, to the ability, technically, to, per to participate. Can you say a little bit about where we are? I know that the mayor has a new initiative on broadband. Uh, where are we? Th because that's a key aspect of inclusion as well. Yeah, I mean, John Paul Farmer, who is the new CTO mm -hmm. for the city, came out with a report um, you know, making it happen is always challenging, but it's an excellent report. I would say the following, you know, this has been, if you ask a high school student, I speak at high schools all the time, do you want sports? Yes. Do you want a library? Yes. What do they really want? Free Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. If you ask that question, every single hand goes up. Um, because in so many households, and, and in, we work a lot with Silicon Harlem, and there are many, many households there that have no uh, free ability to get online at home, uh, libraries are open, but not enough. You know, I could say, but libraries are just not open seven days a week as they should be in terms of long hours. Um, the kiosk is a nice idea, but what am I, I always wanted the bench contract or the table contract to hook up to a kiosk because that's the only way you can't stand there and do your homework. Um, so I would say that, the, and then of course, you know, we 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 tried uh, when I went down to the FCC to testify to say, can we have? Libraries and schools ha used to have E-rate, challenge right now with the current administration. But we used to have E-rates. I used to say, okay, can I take the E-rate in the school and the library and bring it out into the neighborhood? And they said, yeah, if you do that, we're gonna cut off the E-rate at the schools and the libraries. So, I mean, these issues are real for so many uh, low-income parents. We also have the issue in NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, where the walls are very thick. And so, yeah, there are ways of getting some free Wi-Fi, but it's not been easy. Um, some developments have been wired, some not, there have been promises and so on, but I can't say it's a universal positive. So um, we put computer centers, I know Time Warner, when they used to be a Time Warner, um, they were mandated for their contract with the city of New York to put uh, 40 uh, computer centers in the five, five boroughs, or I guess wherever they had uh, connectivity, not the Bronx, which is cable vision. So you know, these are all little band-aids, I would call them in terms of people's access. Uh, the senior centers was another place where we're trying to get, and of course we talked about the schools and some of the challenges they have with bandwidth. 
software, hardware, just five years, that hardware is likely to go. So is it Gale Brewer's Resume that's going to pay for all new technology in that school? Question mark, because that's the funding that we have. We can't do it for, I have 435 schools just in Manhattan, and there are 1,800 in the whole uh, five boroughs. So I guess I'm, you know, I'm a little frustrated, because even though we've had a lot of discussion about it, we had a NYC win, which we remember, with Northrop, gazillion dollars. Every uh, lamppost was for a connectivity for the city agencies, particularly first responders. That's now uh, sort of down the tube. Um, there was some discussion about using those as a connectivity for the public, but we were told there was no firewall possible, so therefore we can't do that. Um, so I'm just saying these have been some of the uh, discussions that I wanted to bring to your attention. You know, I can say that there may be some light at the end of the tunnel, but if you ask general people in the community, what would you really like? Free Wi-Fi, fast connectivity like in other countries would be their number one request. So Gail, Gail's right. Uh, most working class families can't afford broadband. It's $70, $80 a month, $1,000 a year. Um, it's beyond the reach of most, most uh, working class people in New York, and it's a real problem. And, and Gail's also right that what's been happening is really kind of a Band-Aid. But Phil's right that we have to change the mindset about it. So two quick stories. One is I ran into Arnie Duncan at some event when he was the Secretary of Education, and he talked about how he was going to ask Congress to fund E-rate, which is the money that goes to public schools for them to get internet access. So after I was finished speaking, I went up to him and I asked him a question. I said, how many hours in the day are schools actually, I mean, in a year, total hours, are schools actually open, physically open? And when you take in weekends, nights, summer vacation, it turns out that schools are only open 15% of all the time in the year. So then I asked, and Phil and I agreed, uh, 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 Arnie Duncan and I agreed on that number. Then I asked him how, of that time that schools are open, how much time are kids actually in class engaged with a teacher? And he said about half, so that's about 8%. And then I asked him, how much, does, how much of that time does the internet come into play in the education of that child's life? And we agreed on 1% of all the time of the year that in a school, a child would interact with the internet. So then the next question was, so Arnie, how successful would you or any of your staff at the Department of Education be if they only had access to the internet 1% of all the time in the year? And he says, well, we wouldn't be successful at all. What should I do about it? I said, well, you should go into, into Obama's office, bang your fist on his desk, and break up the cartel known as AT&T, Verizon, and Time Warner because they're screwing your kids. They're the ones that are charging way too much money and, you know, and figure out a program where libraries become ISPs. And to that, to that idea, we had a program here in New York that Tony Marks and I spearheaded giving out hotspots to kids in public schools so they could have internet access at home. You could take out a book from a library, you could take a hotspot from a library. That program became national policy under Obama based on a New York progress, uh, pilot, and it was immediately killed by Trump as soon as his new FCC commissioner came in, where they cut all the funding for all of that. So unless we change the mindset that we are living in an economy of abundance, we don't need to just wire schools. We need to wire the people who go to school. And we need to change the regulatory environment in order to create public airwaves. In effect, the same way we have public, uh, public radio, we need to have public broadband, which is what Gail's talking about. I ran for public office, I ran for public advocate in 2004 on the platform of making New York City a wireless city. They thought it was nuts. They thought I was nuts. The, the, <laughs> New, York City, the, New, York City, uh, the New York Times editorial board asked me what Wi-Fi was in my editorial interview. Mike Bloomberg asked me if we have to dig up the streets to put in Wi-Fi. Literally, <laughs> literally. The only person who actually supported my campaign from the public sector was a councilman from Brooklyn named Bill de Blasio, who, as soon as he became mayor, made broadband a major policy initiative. And so it's good to see, but unless we have leadership and vision around solving these problems, we're going to keep doing the band-aids that Gail was talking about. Well, one of the things that I've been working on, you know, with a number of other people is uh, to introduce what I call community collective bargaining, which essentially is consumer organizing, consumer bargaining, um, as a way of help enabling people to leverage their numbers using technology to do things like strike deals for 
broadband or other kinds of things. So one initiative we have in the, we're working on is creating a banking option available through the NYC ID card for low cost banking that we would save most people over $1,000 a year in excess finance charges. But the idea underneath of that is to try and introduce to people, you know if a million people come together, you can actually negotiate a different deal with banks. You can also negotiate a different deal with cable companies. You can negotiate a different deal with all kinds of people. The key is actually it's working together, which we all know in labor and collective bargaining, people do that with employers. But the idea of doing it with internet companies, folks haven't done that. And similarly, we're doing it with eight neighborhoods with SBS we're introducing, where we're getting data from all the card companies. Because anytime you buy something with a card, they track that. Right. What you bought, where you bought, when you bought, how much you spent for it. So we're going to get the data in eight neighborhoods and say, if you're buying 100,000 diapers a month in this neighborhood, let's come together and negotiate a different deal with a vendor on the diapers, lower prices, and then let's have a community discussion about, let's take a portion of those savings and do some things that we think the community needs. One of those things could be broadband. Um, and it's a way of clawing back money that's being extracted from the companies that Andrew's talking about. It's a way of introducing collective action around these things. I have a question for both Gail and Phil, because you guys would know better if this is even possible. But here's an idea. So how about when we're building low-income housing, we incentivize the developers who are building low-income housing to pay for the broadband for the low-income residents that have housing in exchange for a slightly lower tax rate on that building? Or how about we talk about when we give tax breaks to companies who claim they're going to hire employers Give them, a, uh, give them a, a slightly higher one because they're going to hire CUNY graduates or people of color. Uh, how do we create incentives in our existing tax system in order to support this kind of behavior that incentivizes the existing capitalistic mindset to change its behavior to meet the policy goals that we're talking about? No, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we're all struggling on affordable housing to start with, um, and sometimes when you do the uh, public-private partnership, it may not work because you've got the market and the affordable in the same building. I could go on and on about what housing. What about the taxes, scale? If you lower the taxes, you've go, not, not you got to go to Albany. But yes, you could. you got to go to Albany and do that. We have, a, we have the legislature I'm willing, now. We have the, Senate, we have the Senate now. We have the legislature. Uh, and, and Mr. Cuomo thinks of himself as a national leader on, on diversity. So uh -huh. we have an opportunity. Uh, I'm willing to discuss it. I just, uh. I'm realistic. <laughs> I want real answers quickly as opposed to long-term ones that try to go to Albany and do it. But this, it's certainly possible. I just want to talk about data. Are you going to ask? Because I think the other thing we should say positive is New York City has more data than any other place in the United States. And I don't know about the rest of the world. 311 data is really rich. I passed the open data bill. And I have to say that's another reason why companies are here. And to talk about the ecosystem, when you have all this information that can turn into uh, what I would consider civic answers. We work on hackathons all the time. We work with obviously the great people at, C at uh, Civic Hall and certainly with city agencies to use the data to solve problems. But this data is also good for companies that are startups and want to make a difference on their own bottom line. Um, we are going to have data on vacant storefronts, which we're excited about. We passed a bill in the city. The mayor signed it that said every owner of every property that has commercial first and second floor has to give us the data by February of next year, even by the end of this year. And that'll give us where are these storefronts, what's their size, what's their rent, and so on. And I think that, too, will be an example of how you can uh, change policy by having the data. But there's millions of other ways that this data can be used. And it's very exciting. I just wanted to say, Andrew, that uh, we now got legislation from Albany that allows us to evaluate proposals or contracts from the standpoint of what's called best value, mm -hmm. not just the lowest cost. And best value can include things like what you're talking about. Right. And so what we have to do is actually help the contracting agencies imagine what is valuable. Um, and there are developers now who actually do bid and include broadband and things like that in their bids because they have found it actually makes for a better building and over time from even their narrow economic standpoint it's good business but we have the capacity to actually 
add points even for bidders who are not the lowest bid if they're providing other right. things that we deem as value. So there are opportunities for this right now. On this issue that Gail raised about the depth of data that we have in the city, uh, we have the big apps competition, or I've had it in the past, so that we encourage people to come in and think creatively about uh, the data that we use. Um, are we doing enough, and what should we be doing in the, uh, in the civic tech space, understood in this case as leveraging the data assets of New York City on the public side to try to provide better services for the people of the city? Um, well, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, you, we need to make sure that the open data portal, and there's a great deal of effort that goes into it from city agencies, is in real time and is kept up to date and includes as much information as possible. You know, for instance, the police department does put in the seven top categories, but we would love to have other categories to be included, and I could go on and on about the portal. But, you know, it's a, it's a good start, and I think it's perhaps better than many other cities. The second thing is, we need to use it. So what we're doing in our uh, community, meaning our office, is we have Beta NYC, which is a nonprofit, and we work with CUNY students. We've been doing it for five years now. Uh, we have about 12 or 15 of them every single year, and they take that data and that portal and analyze it so they learn, and then they go to the community boards in the borough of Manhattan, which there are 12, and work with them to be able to have the uh, residents and the board members understand it so that they can tell people what it is that's in their neighborhood. New Yorkers want to know what's on my block. They don't really care what's going on in Brooklyn. Manhattanites don't care about Brooklyn, of course. Um, but they also don't care about what's going on you know, below 96th Street if they live above. So this data can help solve the problems of that neighborhood. And that's what we really want. I dream of being able to go to a community board meeting, and up on the screen is the data for that community. It's not as easy as we think. The good news is the CUNY students are getting awesome jobs as a result yes. of knowing how to do this data. So I feel really proud that they're at the big companies, they're working for city government, and that's an example of what you can do when you have the skills. And this is just a year of skills, and they're able to go on and do an appointment. The harder part, to be honest with you, is taking that data and using it to solve problems at the very local level. We've made inroads, but because the software and the hardware are not available necessarily in that community, just to be able to do the analysis in all the places that people meet, and because, um, you know, we've, even though we're training 50 community board members and we're bringing younger members onto the boards, it's still, uh, and a small staff, it's still not where I'd like it to be in terms of use at the local level. I hope, Gail, if you go back to the council, you'll be the chairman of the technology committee. I'm not saying anything, Andrew was saying. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, but if I could just quickly double down on what you just said. So, um, unfortunately, even though Mike Bloomberg complained, uh, you know, touted himself as a tech mayor, he did very little to renovate government during the 12 years. He literally handed Bill de Blasio the same 1980 Pontiac that he got when he took over the government from Giuliani. And one of the challenges is, is that the city's own use of technology is still stuck in a, in a 20th century mindset. There are 140 agencies, um, 100 and some plus CIOs, CTOs. They don't talk to each other. They're not coordinated. There's an office called Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, do it, which is like a systems admin for about 70 or 80 of those agencies and provides the CIO type level. But the other agencies like NYCHA, for example, has their own CIO. The police department has their own CIO. And none of them share data. There's no data standards across the city in a way in which they collect data, share data, analyze data. So uh, the problem is, is that there isn't any central czar. There is not a deputy mayor for technology that all the CIOs report to while they're reporting to their commissioner. There should be. And the city should uh, actually do a strategic plan and deliver to the next administration. You were about to talk about politics, David. This administration has an extraordinary opportunity in the next 18 months to actually step back, look at what Gail's talking about, how open data can catalyze solutions across the city do it in public-private partnerships between technologists, government staff, nonprofits, companies, and build a new landscape for the next administration to really build a 21st century government for New York. Not um, a, we're driving now, maybe with the de Blasio administration, a 1999 Camry instead of a 1980 Pontiac. But we need to be driving a Tesla. 
And the only way to do that is to plan and organize. And when you have an election, you've got 13 weeks between the time the mayor gets elected and when he takes office. Not enough time to plan. Now is the time to plan for the next administration. And the de Blasio administration has an opportunity to actually deliver the future of New York, regardless of who gets elected next. And we've got examples in places like Singapore, right? I mean, there, there, there are or jurisdictions Estonia, Estonia, that Estonia has been doing in Italian. Phil, I'm sorry to please take, it, take your Noted. Um, noted. Uh, I would just agree that uh, we're driving a Pontiac 1999. Um, there are, I, I would say, I have seen sh a shift in momentum. You know, particularly our new CTO office and others, I, I have seen a shift in momentum. But a lot of folks actually were trained and educated in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, and they don't understand what you're talking about. Um, so it's yeah. training. And, training. But, you know, it's a process. And, but I just want to say that um, indiv in individual pieces, things are happening. Um, DYCD has gone a long way in terms of its use of data. Um, there are, in Boston, there's a former student of mine who's from Brooklyn, built a search engine for people who are looking for Section 8 housing. And you type in your family characteristics, do you want to be near an elementary school, do you want to be near transit, blah, 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 blah. And it searches through the entire city, it goes through all the real estate openings, and it shows you all the places that match your criteria, which actually in Boston helps people not just end up in the same neighborhoods all the time, but instead of being in Harlem only or Bed-Stuy only, they'll go to Bay Ridge or they'll go to other places because they'll see there are places there available. We don't even have that, you know, and that's relatively low-hanging fruit. So it's a process, I would say that. But as we're advocating for the future of New York, we also don't have a deputy mayor for climate change. Or for higher education for that matter. And there are, there are things that are happening on our horizon like with 520 miles of coastline and Antarctica melting faster than anybody expected, there are a number of challenges facing New York that are also opportunities. So I agree. I do think we ought to have more future-oriented conversations like this one, more interaction, so we can get everybody on the same page. Let's broaden the politics piece out. You know, there's the institutional politics and shape of government side. Uh, but there's the thing that you mentioned earlier, Andrew, and that's the notion of rocking Google buses and such. Uh, the debacle in uh, Long Island City with Amazon's uh, HQ2. Uh, and, and I don't necessarily want to pull open the top on that box, but the, the notion of popular hostility to technology presence in the city. Um, is, is this something that we should be approaching in a very different way? And I think we can all stipulate that the answer is yes. What is that way? How do we create the inclusive conversation that allows people both to recognize and to shape value in that kind of value plus issue that you were just talking I mean, about? I just think you have to have uh, technology that helps people in their homes or in their schools or in their business. I mean, you can talk about jobs and so on, but let me, example is we now have sensors in the housing development across the street from our office where people can tell real time on their cell phone whether or not they have mold and is the heat working. And then that can be real time to the inspector as opposed to the inspector comes the next day and says, oh, your heat's back on. In addition, we have sensors now with Community Board 4. They're going around the bus stations, which is the worst uh, uh, exhaust in the borough of Manhattan, and saying, OK, 430, everybody's on the street, and this is what the air pollution looks like. And you could go on and on. You got to do something that is real for people's lives. Certainly, a, a, a Section 8 or something that said these are the apartments that are available, that would be an example. You have to use technology to help people in their everyday lives. And I think we sometimes think that you know, the big companies are doing what they're doing, they're providing jobs and so on. But I don't think people feel it, even though technology is all around them, even though there are lots of opportunities, and they don't have free Wi Fi. So I think we have to find something that's personal. I, I think that uh, uh, we have to look at innovating our ownership structures and our financing structures as much as you know, just looking at gadgets. Um, so uh, Amazon has introduced a quarter million robots to stock shelves in their warehouses, and they lay off workers. Invest their own companies you know, have an incentive to just maximize profits. And so when they introduce technology, it's solely with a narrow lens of paying more money to their shareholders, 
maximizing profits. I think we have to look at more employee ownership in terms of technology. Workers who own their own company tend not to lay themselves off and put themselves in the unemployment line when they introduce technology. They may give themselves vacation. They may give themselves retraining. But they don't put themselves in the unemployment line. So we need to innovate that too um, while we're talking about it. The other thing is the tech industry is the whitest industry, the most elitist industry there is. You know, more than finance. It is that. And that's another reason for really focusing on new ownership models. How do we broaden ownership? Who's in the conversation? The city can do a lot in that vein, in the way it structures contracts, in the way it structures rollout of new things like microgrids for energy. All those things, ownership can be dispersed. And it must be if technology is not going to cause mass unemployment in New York City, which it will do. In our current model, if it's just investor oriented, and the, our idea of what makes a good company is narrowly, simply, only what's its ROI, with no other consideration. And that's where we're headed. Do you want to get on this one? I was just going to say, imagine if Uber was owned by the drivers. Um, the 40 or 50 years of failed public policy have created this anger that exists. And I, I was a believer that you're not going to change Amazon by drawing a line in the sand and stopping them from coming. They're coming anyway. Um, the only way to change them is to, is to create incentives with public policy where they guarantee jobs to people from underserved communities in real numbers and not just the menial jobs working in, for example, the warehouses, but actually in the design and the development of research for new products and new services so that they're designed in a way that take into account the impact of, of um, technology. Just one quick example. Airbnb did not start its business thinking that it would reduce the number of low income and moderate income apartments in people's in neighborhoods all across the world actually and actually raising those costs that wasn't their intent their intent was to disrupt the hotel industry but the byproduct of their technology was that low income and moderate income housings are now there are fewer apartments that are being available for a year many people are taking those apartments and making them available on Airbnb that's a cl negative collateral effect public policy failed to recognize that and to regulate it so without regulation, we're going to continue to see Amazons. And it feels right. We need a new framework to incentivize and to change the way in which these companies are formed. One person wants to know, since we have a funding problem, uh, we have lots of uh, wealthy tech entrepreneurs. Uh, the examples here are Bill Gates and Michael Bloomberg, uh, who have extracted billions from the tech industry. My question is, how do we assure the significant amount of the profits from the new NYC tech ecosystem flow back and into investments into places like Baruch? And there's a follow-on CUNY question that, on that as well. And I think you began to address that in your private press. Well, there are lots of ways to do that. and. Uh, uh, there's a uh, legislative proposal from someone from Queens, a, a state senator, and I can't remember her name, to tax the data sales that companies uh, like Google and others, Amazon, do. Because they profile you whenever you look at a website, whenever you buy something, and then they sell those profiles to advertisers. That is untaxed. It's a sale, but it's untaxed. Last year, 97% of Facebook's profits was that selling people's profiles, 97% untaxed. So the proposal is to start taxing that. That's one way. There are a variety of different ways to go at that, but I do believe government has to catch up to what's going on in the marketplace and technology to, to address these kinds of things, and there can be revenue there. The other thing I would say, two weeks ago the mayor said, I'm going to go to the public pension funds, which have over $200 billion, just New York City worker pension funds, and I'm going to request $500 million for small business from that. Now, right. he needs the state comptroller, the city comptroller to go along. And the borough presidents. And the borough presidents. But I think it's a great idea because part of that $500 million, and that's just for starters, could be for tech. Start, just what we're talking about right here. Why not? What it takes is getting everybody on the same page. It's not just about going to traditional financing sources and asking Goldman Sachs or you know, Wall Street, will you invest in this? There are other big players who traditionally just give their money to Goldman Sachs, just give me a return, I don't care how you get it. And we can be a lot more strategic and directive with those folks. You know? And the, it's their kids who we're talking about here. 
So I just think we can innovate in lots of ways. A lot of young people today don't want to work for you or me or Andrew or anybody. They want to be entrepreneurs. And so that is obviously the mindset of young people from all over the world to go to CUNY in many cases. So the question is, how do we make those entrepreneurships, or you could call them startups, or whatever term you want to use, something that, again, is very much a part of the DNA of CUNY? And again, I go back to funding, because obviously that's something that would be needed. The students uh, who are at Macaulay and who are here at Baruch and some of the other colleges do manage, I think, to get out into some of these opportunities. But there are, as we heard earlier, many, many students here who could do the same. Let me ask a, a, a question that, uh, from, from the floor that uh, everybody, that I think we should all be properly concerned about. The panel has put forward many provocative ideas of future innovations uh, and changes with broadband technology and the leverage of city data. Can you comment on protecting privacy yeah, sure. and making sure that people's personal data is used ahead, in ways that are genuinely in their self-interest and uh, those data are safe? Such a, this is such a thorny issue. Yeah, so without pub proper public policy on these issues, it's going to be really, really hard. It's, we, you know, surveillance cameras are everywhere. Um, and, in, 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 and we actually, let me ask everybody in the audience, when was the last time you actually read a terms of service all the, you know, all the way through before you clicked agree when you no, downloaded please. an app to your phone? No, no, no. Okay, so you're all responsible. There's a lawyer probably who raised his hand there. <laughs> So you're all, we're all guilty of this, right? We don't, we, we, we make assumptions around the, the data that somehow we're gonna be protected. The reality of it is, is we're not protected at all. They're actually not, and, the, when, and the, the tech companies and the apps, they say, here's our privacy policy, please agree. It's actually not a privacy policy, it's a data usage policy. Right. We're not even calling it the proper thing, right? They're using our data in ways that we don't even know. And there are companies that are massively capitalized that are mining that data, Equifax and others, Infor and others that are using that data and selling that data and they're doing it in ways that there's no oversight, there's no regulation and not even talking about the NSA and we're not even talking, we're, and we're just talking about the United States, talk about places in other parts of the world where there, where there are totalitarian regimes that are now building entire new systems and the acceleration of technology where there's facial recognition that's not being even thought about in how it may imp imp impact society. And when you have the biases, the racial biases that we see in systems, whether it be funding systems like Phil was talking about, or education systems where CUNY doesn't get the, its due. And algorithmic and, bias. Uh, right. There, there's algorithmic bias now. We have a problem. And the only way that it's going to get fixed is if we actually elect people to put in laws to actually stop private companies from exploiting people's personal data. Until that happens, we're going to see an explosion of abuse, which is continuing and growing and is unfettered. So as much as we talk about the, the future of technology, we need to ele elect people like Gail Brewer and, and others who recognize, understand technology enough and can actually write legislation to stop the unfettered use of people's personal data. There is so much more on these topics to cover. We have run out of time to do so this morning, but we will continue to focus on these issues here at the Mark School and across CUNY, I can safely say, as we continue to engage uh, with this very critical component of the future of this city. Thank you again very much. I'm great to see everybody here for some familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, we'll be back here for the next Mark's Issues Breakfast. Thank Thanks, everyone.